Welcome to this video that looks into the some of the history of particle physics briefly. So here are the things that we're going to tell you a little bit about. Um, a bit of an understanding of the background history and how this leads to where we are today. Um, the history parts aren't things that you'll be tested on within your higher physics exam, but sometimes it's good to put some knowledge and a bit of background um, to see sort of what, how we got to where we are just now and to make sense of what we are looking at in more detail. The ancient Greeks had four different elements, fire, air, earth and water. We now know, of course, that's not correct, but um, was what they believed at the time. What you could do whilst you're watching is you could make some brief notes, either in a document or on some paper about just to give you an outline of when things happened and what type of things um, were found out. So the first person to propose an atom was a Greek person called Democritus. And he came up with atom from the Greek word atmos, which means uncuttable. So he thought, what would happen if I took something and I cut it in half and in half and in half and in half and I kept going like that at some point he thought he would get to a point where he was unable to make it any smaller and he said that would be what I'm going to call an atom based on it being not cuttable and he thought different things that are made out of different things must have different sizes and shapes of these uncuttable objects. A long time later, uh, Lavoisier uh, did an experiment where he discovered that the total mass in a chemical reaction stays the same. Uh, you can you can do things like this. You can uh, one of the things you might do in chemistry is you can burn some iron wool like a Brillo pad. And then you see that the mass of the Brillo pad burnt is greater because you, when you've burnt something, you're making an oxide. And so he did experiments that saw that the total mass remained the same always, or at least as far as he knew. And he defined elements as something that we couldn't break down. Dalton did experiments, lots of them too. He was English and he uh, he looked, said diff different elements have different masses and we've got these atoms that we can't make smaller or destroy them and they combine differently to make different chemical compounds. And of course, we'll have heard about Mendeleev and his periodic table where he set out elements in a pattern and that pattern allowed him to predict the properties of the elements and arrange them in the columns, the groups, according to those properties. And what was great about his approach was that he'd left spaces for things that he thought should be there and weren't there and subsequently they were discovered. So he made a prediction and then um, on the basis of his prediction, somebody was able to find the missing gaps. Uh, Thompson, just before the year 1900, so when Queen Victoria was on the throne, discovered the electron and he thought atoms inside there, because he'd find these smaller things than an atom, he thought atoms might be like what they call the plum pudding model, sometimes we call that a muffin model now. So you've got a cake and you've got lots of chocolate muffins or blueberries within it and they're like the positive and negative charges that are within it. Um, so this is the kind of model he came up with. Okay, 1909 in Manchester, uh, Geiger of Geiger counter fame and a gentleman called Marsden were working for Ernest Rutherford, who was from New Zealand, uh, originally a sheep farmer, but he must have been quite well to do. Um, because he was highly educated and uh, one of the foremost scientists at the time. So he was working in the University of Manchester and they did an experiment that found that the atom was mostly empty space with a positive charge center. 
Um, this is part of your course, and we're going to look and set you a particular task to do looking at Rutherford's model of the atom and his the gold leaf experiment that was carried out on his behalf. At a similar time, uh, Danish scientist Niels Bohr, um, he came up with a lot of mathematical models of atoms and he came up with this sort of the planetary model that we kind of know today with the electrons orbiting the nucleus but that those orbits have particularly particular amounts of energy levels um, he was able to describe it in mathematics tall terms which some scientists really didn't like um, worth adding that um, Niels Bohr got a lot of his money from the Carlsberg Brewery. So beer really did make a good contribution to physics. Uh, James Chadwick discovered the neutron and this helped explain why different isotopes of the same element existed. So an isotope being the same element because the element's decided by the number of protons, but if it has different number of neutrons, it has different mass. And this was explained as another particle that was needed to stop the positive protons repelling and the nucleus not holding together. And we'll learn more about something called the strong force, which holds the nucleus together. Because we know nucleus has protons within it, so and protons have positive charge, so they should repel, so it shouldn't be a stable situation. And it's the neutrons and the strong force that hold it together because that force is greater than the force of them pushing apart. Okay, at this point, people thought, oh, it's all complete. We've explained lots of elements with three particles, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. But the simplicity. Paul Dirac produced mathematical equations that predicted there should be a positively charged electron. We now call that a positron. And American scientist Carl Anderson at Caltech University in California uh, went on to find this particle. And this led to the fact that every particle has what we call an antiparticle, a particle that has the same mass but the opposite charge. Um, we'll do more on antimatter uh, within this topic. Anderson won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1936 for his work. And we mentioned Anderson using a cloud chamber. So a cloud chamber is a place where you can see ionizing radiation. So if you have alpha source in an ionizing radiation very much, it leaves those trails, a bit like planes in the sky. Uh, beta source, less ionizing, so you wouldn't see that. Gamma radiation, you don't see at all. Um, alpha particle being an anti-electron a positron is like the beta particles and if you then place it in an electric field you can deflect the charge in a particular way to show that it's positive charge not an electron um, this led to a whole load of discoveries about antimatter these two scientists working under Enrico Fermi discovered the antiproton this team, working in America as well, discovered the anti-neutron. So what is antimatter? Well, antimatter is the same as matter in every way apart from charge. Um, there's also some other properties called spin as well, but for our course, we don't deal with that. When matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate, they give off energy. So if they meet together, there's a burst of energy released as photons, depending on the frequency, so often gamma radiation. So using particle accelerators led to scientists finding more than 200 different particles. So many, they called it a zoo. And because there were so many, it was really, really confusing. And we needed a simple model to sort it all out. And that model that we will learn about particularly for this course is called the standard model.